The chair recognizes Mr. Richard Arthur. Maybe Richard Angel Arthur. Could you, yes. Would you state your name just to sure. clarify? Could my family start? name is Angel, spelled with two L's. And my given names are Richard Arthur, and I usually go by Rich. Well, I beg your pardon. Sir. No problem. Sir. Please continue. Yes, I have three brief points that I want to make. One, Judge Lynn pointed out that if jurors are suspected at the voir dire to have an agenda or or who will judge the law as well as the facts of the controversy, they will be dismissed. Um, to me, that's that's a, an act of stacking the jury against the defendant by using jurors who actually think. But I want to point out that this is a good way to make liars out of jurors who want to be on the jury and do the right thing. I'm one of them. If I'm ever in voir dire, I can tell you straight up that I will lie if necessary. If I am asked, will you judge the law, will you follow instructions, will you, I will lie if necessary to get on that jury. Just as I would lie if necessary to protect Jews in, in my attic if the Gestapo came knocking on the door. Or say, um, if somebody came knocking on my door looking for running, runaway slaves and I happen to be part of the Underground Railroad. Second point. I've heard it said from time to time that with jury nullification we would have utter chaos. I would like to point out that we have utter chaos. This country, supposedly a free country, you don't hear that very much anymore, but it's supposedly a free country. We have more people in prison than any other country in the world. That's both per capita and in sheer numbers. And the reason for which we have so many people in prison is because we are not a free country. It's because we have more laws. We have tens of millions of laws on the book. Very, very few of them having anything to do with protecting the life, liberty, and property of individuals. Jury nullification is absolutely necessary to reverse that trend, to stem the tide of tyranny and the judicial system run amok. Finally, third point. Almost invariably, the strongest opponents of jury <coughs> nullification are judges and prosecuting attorneys. Isn't it time that this country were run by the people and the principles of liberty and justice for all rather than judges and prosecuting attorneys who are defending their profession? Unless there be any questions, I'm finished. Any questions for Mr. Angel from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, sir. The chair recognizes Mr. Dennis Goddard. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some written testimony in the, in the interest of brevity. Can I leave it with you to in be In the distributed? interest of brevity, you may do anything you want whatsoever. <laughs> One copy for each member of the committee. As you can imagine, much of what I'd like to say has been said already, so I'll... I can easily imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my name is Dennis Goddard. I'm here representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. <coughs> the Liberty Alliance is strongly in favor of this bill. I, I just want to touch on a few points that were brought up by other testators and lay a few things to bed. First of all, there is no way for me, a completely uneducated citizen on matters of, uh, of law, to contradict uh, a judge, su such as Judge Lynn. So I won't try to do that. I'll leave that to John Jay, the first Supreme Court, um, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and in the handout which I'm giving you, I gave you a specific ruling. It's State of Georgia versus Brailsford, 1794. The exact quote from which Judge Jay says, you juries have a right to take it upon yourselves to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. 
So let's not talk about whether it's a power or a right. I'm sorry that the first Chief Justice of the United States contradicts an earlier test day law. Now, I would also point out there's been a lot of discussion about do we have a different process now in modern enlightened times whereby 400 representatives take the pressure off and deal with public policy decisions. I would point out that in 1794, the United States did in fact have an elected legislature. This was not in contest at that time. It had nothing to do with feudalism. It was still acknowledged as a right at that time. Now, one item that I haven't heard, you know, I, I want to get this out of the way. There's no question about whether this is a right. I'm confused by a lot of the debate, frankly, today. I've been hearing a lot of debate about whether there should be a right. Please understand that, at least according to the Supreme Court of the United States, that's not up for grabs. That's not up for discussion. There's nothing this legislature can do about that. The only question that we have, and the only bill that's before you, is about whether the jury should be informed of that right. That's the only question, really, that we've got to discuss. And I would like to call your attention to the fact that on June 8, 1992, the United States of America ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We've been talking a lot about the fact that we are a nation of laws. My understanding of the way that treaties work is that they're kind of somehow above, and I'm kind of kind of lay person. But that, that treaty that was ratified by the United States says in part, quote, a government may not stand in the way of the people learning about their rights. Now in the United States, I'm not, I don't think anyone before you has made the assertion that any active opposition has come to preventing jurors from understanding their rights. I think the concern here is that the line between inaction and obstruction is dangerously close in our present society. If I go and I ask school children, how many of you know that for certain crimes you get a right to trial by your, your peers? They don't know that. And if I say, you know that you have an obligation to serve on a jury in that case, most of them know that. And if I say, you know that you have a right to judge the law as well as the facts of the case, I don't think the number of, I don't think you can count the number of children that know that on, on, on your hands. Okay. Imagine if this was some other right that you know of as a right, say, free speech or free assembly that we simply just never bothered to instruct our children about for generation after generation until no one knew. And some crazy crackpot libertarians and constitutionalists were the only ones talking about that kind of stuff. Do you think we would have had civil rights demonstrations? Do you think we would have Tea Party demonstrations? Do you think it would be a bad thing if those things went away? Well, we, maybe it would be. But those demonstrations are the process by which our society avoids the kinds of not peaceful demonstrations we see in other societies populated by human beings no different than you or I, who I venture differ only in the structure of their government. So my last point, and I'll leave you alone. There's a reason that there's so much emotion here over what you think is a pretty arcane piece of legislative tribute. The reason is there's a sense of hypocrisy and duplicity. That we can have an edifice of law constructed on the notion of rights and say those are rights and at the same time make no effort to instruct and educate the people of those rights. That's why these people <laughs> are taking time out of their lives. That's why I've got to explain to my boss where I've been all day. Um, you know, this is my thesis. Um, I think most of us here, to test my favorite skill, feel strongly that neglecting to educate people about their rights or it, it is, in fact, acting to disparage them of their rights. And the emotion comes about because we feel <coughs> This leads to a government that has lost the moral authority to govern. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Goddard from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, sir. The chair recognizes Mr. John Barnes.